<laughs> well, here we are live. Welcome to our uh, first fishing presentation for Oriva Stays. I'm Tom Rosenbauer, and we have, uh, luckily, we have an entomology expert here. Maggie Human from Orvis Jackson Hole. How's it going? Good. How is everybody doing out there? Ready for ready to fish those uh, fall dry flies? And you know, the, there's a little bit of a misnomer when uh, we call this fishing the small dry flies of fall because in the eastern United States, it's mostly small. Dry flies, but Maggie said, "Well, we fish a lot of big stuff out here in the fall, so um, so we're going to talk about. We're not going to just talk about little flies. We're going to talk about big flies, right, Maggie? Yep, a few big flies, a few pretty small ones, though. But yeah, so I mean, I was just talking to Tom before we got started about kind of the differences between the east and the west. I mean, this is, I would say, one of the more more parallel." times of year that we have similar hatches. Um, like you were just saying, we do have a couple of pretty big bugs out here in the West in the fall, but for the most part, it kind of centralizes around things like blue winged olives, which are a mayfly species, um, midges, which are a type of fly, and then a lot of different species of caddis. Um, you tend to hear the word October caddis and a lot of different species actually get lumped into that. Um, there's really one main October caddis, but the limnophilid family has quite a few different species. And um, I'm not sure about in the East, but I... Oh, we lost Maggie there for a minute. There you go. Sorry, we lost you for a sec, Maggie. All right, everybody can see me. <laughs> yeah, we lost you at uh, uh, the east, October caddis in the east. But what I was saying is we have multiple species out west, and we even have one called the snow sedge that emerges in the middle of winter. Um, mm. But they're, they're pretty hefty, but the biggest difference, um, and we'll kind of get into this more, is, is, you know, that they have... They're more of a solitary species of caddis, so they don't have these like massive hatches like they do with a Mother's Day caddis, um, you know, earlier in the springtime where you've just got, you know, you're choking on caddis when you go out to fish the river. This is more mm -hmm. of a solitary type of species. Okay. Well, you know, maybe we should uh, maybe we should first go through go through your your slideshow to show people you know, what some of these things look like and how they might identify them. And um, then we can talk a little about fishing them. And then we can um, answer questions. Oh, Dave, uh, when we're west, when we say east and west, we're generally talking east of the Mississippi, west of the Mississippi. There's kind of a dividing line there in, you know, because the center of the country, there isn't much, there isn't much, uh, there isn't a lot of trout fishing. It's more centered east, upper Midwest, and and the, the Rocky Mountains, and uh, from the Rocky Mountains west. So it's kind of an arbitrary, arbitrary line, right? Why don't I why don't I pull up your slides? Yeah, let's maybe start with mayflies there, and we okay. can kind of go through what are the more important insect species that we're How's that looking? Trying to get it to go to, there we go. How's that? Maggie, hello. Sounds like we lost Maggie again. Maggie, you there? Well, uh, I can talk a little bit about mayflies. These are Maggie's slides, but, um, you know, mayflies are uh, one of the most 
if not the most important trout stream insect. Um, they have two or three tails, and they have wings that look like little sailboats. You know, when when they're on the water, uh, they look like little sailboats, and they live uh, underwater as what we call nymphs or larvae, and um, they rise to the surface at certain times of year. Uh, each species will hatch at a distinct time of year. And so you have different species of mayflies hatching um, and being on the surface and being available to trout um, in the fall, different, different species than you do uh, in the spring or the summer. Uh, they often look alike, but they're, they're a little bit different. And can you hear me guys? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. We lost you for a second. I kind of gave <laughs> mayflies. Sorry. You still there, Maggie? Thank you. Maggie. I'm having a hard time here. And, um, but yeah, it sounds like you were just diving in on the mayfly portion of things. Um, right. That's right. one pretty unique one when um when we're talking about insects anyway because i'm sure you kind of went into already the difference between a dun and a spinner mm -hmm. can you hear me you still there maggie no okay well uh, um i'll kind of pick up here the the nymphs have two or three claws. Uh, very important. They have one tar tarsal claw on each leg. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to worry about looking for tarsal claws. Uh, but they do. Uh, I didn't even know that before this. Uh, but they do have gills on the abdomen, which is um, which distinguishes them from stoneflies. Um, and then the adults, they have a hind wing, although... Again, it's get pretty close to find the hind wing. Uh, it's a little tiny wing behind the big wing. Uh, but the big wing looks like a sailboat. It's kind of triangular. And uh, they have two or three tails. Uh, this is a very common, this is a family beta D, which uh, blueing olive, uh, olives, fall olives uh some people even call these blue quills i've heard them called blue quills in in the east and they're kind of a usually a oh god they're um the adults are a, a olivey brown or an olivey gray sometimes they're an olivey yellow it depends on the exact species and there's lots of them it's one of the most um it's one of the most common mayflies in the world worldwide they'll they'll occur everywhere um everywhere there are trout streams and they're typically now tom yeah yeah okay I, I just connected on my cell phone i think our wi-fi is a little needy here <laughs> okay. But, okay um but yeah so so i see you kind of dove in on on the betas there yeah and um did you mention kind of the difference in I guess you haven't really gotten into yet how we're fishing these guys. Um, no. Nope. But nope. the difference between the duns and the spinners. Nope. And, and Didn't how get you get there yet. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So sorry if I'm just like interjecting here, but, um, but yeah, the family betas is a swimmer mayfly. So again, we're, we're kind of talking more about the dry flies here, but um but when you talk about mayflies, they have such delicate little bodies. They have the ability to emerge in the surface film of the water. Um, we'll talk about some later that are a little bit more robust bodied. So they have to kind of crawl out on different surfaces on the edge of the water. But these guys can emerge in the surface film. Um, so they provide a great opportunity to fish um, as like an emerger or a cripple type pattern right in the middle of the water. You don't have to be right up next to a bank. You can kind of prospect on a lot of different places in the water column or in the stream um, to fish these guys. But mainly um, what makes mayflies unique besides those upright wings is the fact that they shed their exoskeleton a second time as an adult. They're the only insects that do that. So they molt one last time from what's called a dun to a spinner, 
or from a sub imago to an imago um, in the insect terminology. And when that happens, um, they're kind of put at risk as well, especially if they're, if they're near the water, they make a very, very easy meal for the trout. But one really unique thing um, I find with the betas is the fact that you're not, um, you're not really fishing the spinner patterns a lot. A lot of times that's happening at night. And so we're not really fishing those too, too often. Like, you know, I laugh when I do fly ordering and catalogs and um, you never hardly see beta spinner patterns. Would you say that's fairly true on the East coast as well? You're not really fishing the spinners. Not, not really. I have seen beta spinner falls. I, I saw one once in Colorado that was pretty amazing and it was pretty mm -hmm. good fishing, but, but it's rare. Yeah, it's rare. Yeah, de definitely a rarity. So um, yeah. you can see in this picture here that, and we'll, we'll show you an up more up close picture in a second, but this one has a more opaque wing. So you can't really see all the way through it. It's more of that grayish bluish color, which hence the name blue winged olive. Um, you know, we don't call them a clear winged olive for a reason, but yeah, if you do hit that odd temperature combination where you're seeing a spinner fall for these guys, it is a pretty unique thing to fish. So, you know, it never hurts to have a pattern in your box that might, might work for it. But, um, most of the time we're fishing the done form of these mayflies. So having something with kind of that slate wing or, you know, a bluish greenish grayish wing tends to work well in an upright pattern. Maggie, since these are swimmers, do you find that uh, fishing a small nymph with um, a little bit of action can be beneficial? Definitely. Um, I was out on a fishing trip on Mon Tuesday and um, we were fishing little RS2 patterns, you know, with some CDC. So they have provided a little bit of that, you know, abdominal plate like gill that was kind of swimming around, you know, in, in the water. And so I think having something that just kind of drags, we had it behind like smaller little foam bugs. And so it was just kind of dragging in the water there and imitating that swimmer. And it seemed to work pretty darn well. Mm. But yeah, they, you can see the one in this picture has got pretty dark and wing pads. So he's getting ready to emerge. So a lot of times with that little bit of darker portion right there on the thorax um, does well to imitate something that's about to emerge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me know when you want me to move on to the next slide. Um, yeah. So again, there's a lot of details on these slides. Nothing you really have to read into too much. Um, I just like putting the information there in case people want to know, but beta probably are the most abundant species um, of mayflies there are there's so much variation in this group in this family um you've got everything from the blue winged olives like we mentioned to your still water like your calabatus so it really covers a wide swath of different types of mayflies um and they can have multiple generations per year just one generation per year they can have one generation with multiple broods per year i think people have started to understand broods a little bit more this year with the big cicada hatch and so um you know not doesn't necessarily mean that it's hatching multiple times a year it just might be that the eggs were laid in different portions of a river system at um you know different times of the year and so they're hatching out but just having one major emergence um, but they're pretty small. So, I mean, we're not talking about a huge, huge bug here. These are, these are pretty small. I would say, you know, 16 would be a pretty large size, but, uh, you know, down to 22 and you were saying you even have like pseudos that you guys fish down or out on the East coast that get down to like 24s and 26s. So definitely a smaller bug pattern that we're talking about here. Yeah, that's a it's a it's kind of an annoying bug, but sometimes <laughs> you have to you go to it. We do have a lot of those little tiny. They're fairly pale owls, but they're really skinny, mm -hmm. and you know they're a good twenty four, twenty six. Yeah, sometimes you get away with a twenty two or even a twenty, but boy, if the fish are snotty, it you you have sometimes have to go that small. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and I mean, I would say. I've been out fishing in the mornings and seen these guys. I've been out fishing in the evening and seen, 
you know, thick amounts of beta. So it's kind of variable depending on, you know, the weather and the temperature. All these insects are emerging. It's basically a math problem um, with a combination of the air temperature and the water temperature when they're going to come out. So, um, you know, I tend to like to go out personally and fish in the evenings, but I think these are a pattern that you can definitely fish all day. Um, my husband's a fishing guide and we joke a lot of the times, like even during like green drake hatches and these big bug hatches that happen in the spring and early summer, you know, it, he'll tie a blue winged olive trailer on and nine times out of 10, the fish is going to eat the blue winged olive because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I kind of yeah. associate it with like Thanksgiving, you know, when you're, when you're eating and eating and eating during these big hatches and you've had tons and tons of big food. And then, you know, maybe somebody comes back by with the cheese straws again, or they come back by with a turkey leg. Which mm -hmm. one do you have room for? <laughs> and, and a lot of times they tend to key in on that smaller one still, even if there's big stuff happening. Okay. All right. You want to go to the next one? Yeah. Oh, there's some close-ups of some betas. Yep. Those are just bigger versions of that picture in case you guys couldn't see. Um but I really like that picture on the right of that upwing, you know, slate gray colored wing. And then you can see those really big turbinate eyes on the top of its um, head. So turbinate just means that they're touching. And I don't know if you mentioned this already, Tom, when I was cutting out, but, um, but if you can see the eyeballs on a mayfly, it's a male. That's pretty much a dead giveaway. Um, mm. If you can't see the eyeballs, it's a female. But if they have these large turbinate eyes that are touching on the top of their head, it is most definitely a male. Um, mm. They tend to get that elongated abdomen too and claspers so that they can um, grab the females in midair and mate. But the dead giveaway always is going to be the eyeballs. Mm -hmm. mm. Do fish prefer males over females? I think fish are opportunistic and they prefer whatever's <laughs> in front of them. <laughs> We're not talking about a lot of things with huge brains here, you know. These are a lot of <laughs> mm -mm. animals with just ganglia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But the phlebias. So leptophlebiidae or leptophlebias or paraleps as some people like to call them um that gets down to more of the genus but that's your group family name for mahogany duns um i was like i said out on the river earlier this week and we saw a fair amount of these guys as well um they tend to be more of a fall colder weather emergence but um the dead giveaway on the nymphs is they've got abdominal gills that are forked in some way. They're really thread-like. Um, so again, I think that lends itself to fishing, you know, nymph patterns that have a lot of CDC on them, anything that's moving quite a bit. Um, we fish a ton of pheasant tails around here that have CDC coming off of Maggie, them. And I think they we're make losing, it we're losing you a little bit. Great there. mahogany done nymph. And more of a, a not the best service here. Can you hear me better? Yeah, it sounds better. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these guys, um, they're scrapers. They just scrape rocks for algae and different types of things as a nymph. And then when they emerge, um, again, similar to the betas, they don't have to have a whole lot of structure to emerge on. They can emerge right in the surface tension of the water. Um, and then they come out as a mahogany dun, as we call them. Again, that slate colored wing as they emerge as a dun. And then they shed that second adult exoskeleton and they become a spinner. And so when that happens, um, the spinner, I tend to say we fish a little bit of both when it comes to mahoganies, probably more so than with the blue wings where we're just fishing a dun. Um, I feel like I have just as much luck with a dun as I do with a spinner pattern when I'm fishing these guys. But then again, I, I feel like emergers are a great, great option as well. Um, but like a rusty spinner type of fly is always a good go-to. 
I think for a mahogany emergence. Um, fish tend to really, really like those. They're a little bit bigger in size. So, you know, we're fishing like 14s and 16s in those. But, um, but yeah, they're definitely a little bit bigger than the, the blue wings. And you said that you guys have, you know, more of um, like is on the, on the East coast that people tend to call mahoganies. Well, we get, we get parallels, uh, but they're a spring mayfly. I don't mm -hmm. know as I've ever, I've ever seen a hatch in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very important in the spring in May. Mm -hmm. uh, and the spinners, as you said, are as important as the duns. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't ever recall. There may be rivers where they they hatch in the fall, but it's a spring mayfly. In the right, East. and you'll you'll see that in a lot of like guidebooks and things that it's a that it's a spring to fall, and you're like, well, that really narrows it down. But that's yeah, what, right. <laughs> um, is it? It's kind of alluding to the fact that on the east coast, it's more of a spring bug. On the west, you know, in the Rocky Mountain region, and on the west coast, it's more of a fall type of yeah. bug. Um, Seems but, to be, yeah. You know, entomologists and fly fishermen are not the most creative. So again, the blue winged olive is pretty much describes what that was. Mahogany done describes the color here. It's definitely mm -hmm. more like a dark brown, rusty color. Um, so honestly, the main pattern that I fish for this um, outside of the rusty spinner is just like a, a parachute pheasant tail. Um, I think those work great. If you don't have one of those, grab a parachute atoms and get like a black Sharpie and color on it a little bit and it'll, it'll be mm. fine. So mm. it doesn't, you don't have to overcomplicate things, but, um, they don't have a really prominent hind wing as an adult. Um, a lot of the bigger mayfly species have a prominent hind wing and these guys have a much more, um, prominent just forewing, wing. And so, it's just like a big oval shape that you're going to see. It's pretty like teardrop. Like it's not, um, it's not very visible to see that second wing. So they're pretty easy to identify just based on the time of year and the fact that you can't really see a second wing. Mm -hmm. okay. And then there's some up close pictures after this of those two. So you can see I've got a nymph in my hand. It's got three tails and then those gills that run along its abdomen are forked or very thread-like. And then you can see that super oblong wing on the right-hand side of the adult. And if you'll notice on that one, there's no real prominent eyeballs on that. So I'm going to go ahead and say that's a female. And they're very skinny. So pheasant tail, pheasant tail or a biot body or something like that. You don't want a big uh, bulky fly for these guys. It's right. so skinny. Right. Caddisflies. Yeah, caddisflies. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the big the big three bugs, caddisflies, mayflies, stoneflies, stoneflies at this point in the year are kind of done for us um, until the winter bugs start happening, but really caddis flies um, start coming into play as much as the mayflies do to me. Um, but caddis flies are in order trichoptera that actually literally translates into hair, hair wing. So they're really closely related to like butterflies and moths. Um, Whereas, you know, if you've ever touched a butterfly wing, they have what's called scales that come off. You get that powdery substance on your hands. Um, Caddis flies have more of these fine little hairs when you touch them. So they don't have that powdery substance that comes off. So if you ever really need to test the waters to figure out what something is, <laughs> you can touch its wing if you've got an adult and see. Um, but they have what's known as aquatic complete metamorphosis. So they go through a complete change in their life cycle from nymph to adult, which involves having a pupil stage. Um, so that means that they, they have to pupate at some point in their life. You know, some of them do it over winter. Some of them do it throughout the year. Um, it all depends on species. And this will apply when we talk about true flies as well, which will be next. Um, but they've got six legs as a larva, so they're much more worm-like appearance um, versus that mayfly we were just looking at. who has got a more sprawled out, flattened body. Um, you see them clinging to rocks and things. But the larva um, 
tend to be a whole lot skinnier. And there's a couple different species or, or different groups of caddis that do different things, whether or not it's build a case or if it, they're free living. Um, so they've got lots of different adaptations throughout their life as a larva that they can use to kind of protect themselves from predators. Um, but the big one that we talk about in fall um, is the limnophilids, and I think they're on the next slide. And I say big because they're actually big. Um, well, we yeah, there. But yeah, so they've got a really big case that they make. They'll stitch together rocks and sticks and different things. Um, they've actually got a uh, little net spinner. So they've got silk spinner spinners that they can use to create this case and to help close off their pupa when they're ready to pupate and change into an adult. But um, limnophils are pretty big, so they can get up to like two inches long. And as I was saying in the beginning, um, we've got some species out west that even emerge in the middle of winter. That uh, picture on the far right, which you'll get a close up of in a minute, it's it's in the middle of snow. Um, that's called a snow sedge. But we get a lot of different variations of like an orange, orange and gray kind of coloration to those um, when they emerge. And so, again, October caddis is like a blanket term that a lot of folks use when they're talking about them, but, um, but there's a lot of different species amongst the limnophilids. Um, I tend to fish it in like a big elk hair caddis pattern. There are some specific October caddis patterns that come in the orange and the gray variations, but you know, and just an orange, like size 10, even sometimes eight elk hair caddis works wonderfully. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't ever fish it because I see a bunch of them. It's more of a prospect prospecting type of fly. Like I'll just throw it in a pool and see, but I've, I've had quite a bit of luck the last couple of falls using um, October caddis patterns in different areas, just kind of trying to scare up a trout and see what they're doing. Maggie, are the, we have a, a lot of uh, what we call stick caddis uh, in the East, typically in slower pools lower gradient um and they they have you know they use a lot of sticks and twigs and they're big and they crawl around the bottom they're kind of free crawling is that a limnophilid too um yeah most likely if they're pretty mm -hmm. big sized um that's yeah they're big they're big that's usually a dead giveaway that and they um they tend to have cases that are made out of all sorts of different things it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. just rocks or just twigs um yeah. If you're ever really wanting to get in the weeds on that, um, macroinvertebrates.org is a great um, web resource. They've got all Eastern bugs on there. So it would apply to more of what you guys are seeing out there on the East. Um, but they've got an awesome, awesome identification tools and stuff like that to kind of tell what the cases, um, what species are living in the different cases. But there, there's a couple oh, of other cool. big caddis species, but that's the main one. That okay. we see a lot of. Okay. And there's some close ups of the limnophilids. Yep. You can see that one pulled out of his case there. Um, yeah, that one's under the scope in the bottom bottom left hand corner on that last slide. That and you, mm -hmm. you kind of see those lumps. Caddis are crazy. You pull them out of your, their case and you've got to identify them by different what they call warts and things on their mesonotum so kind of behind their head they've got different plates sometimes that you have to count or different ways that their gills are shaped but they do have abdominal gills down that large larval body and you can see all their six legs are kind of crammed up there in the front versus you know the mayfly that had them more spread out don't think i'm going there i think i'll leave that to you yeah, it, like I said, <laughs> definitely in the weeds, but, you know, I'm like, people in like fly fishing 101 classes and stuff like that. I'm like, hey, you know, if it looks like a size 16 and it's small and brown, pull something out of your box. It's a size 16 and small and brown. It does not have to go. be exact names and matching up in that kind of regard. But it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> okay. 
So Glossosoma is another um, cat of species that's very, very easy to identify in its larval stage. Um, they're called the saddle case makers and they glue themselves to rocks. So they're small, um, their cases are small little groups of rocks and they're glued to rocks. So if you ever pick up a rock and there's a bunch of small little groups of rocks stuck to it, you're most likely looking at Glossosoma or saddle case makers. Um, they're a fairly small um, caddis fly in comparison to the limnophilids. So you're thinking like 16s and 18s, maybe even smaller than that. Um, I don't think these are of particular importance, but they, they can emerge, you know, through the end of October or so here. Um, they would definitely have more of an emergence than the limnophilids as far as quantity wise. They tend to group together. They're not so solitary. Um, but you can see the adult there on the right hand side and it's got that super modeled wing and that angle at the back of it. So again, looks a lot like a moth as an adult. Um, it pupates in that little case that it makes and it's, it's kind of like a little uh, maggot looking thing. So if you ever pull them, pull them off of the rocks and flip them over, they're a pretty chunky little maggot looking type of larva. Again, not something I think is of mega importance, but if you're, you know, again, out prospecting for fish and not really sure what they're eating, but it's something smaller than an October caddis, but bigger than a blue winged olive, that might be a, a good pattern to prospect with. Let's see if we got any questions here. Yeah, I'm not able to see the questions because I've got the full screen up here. Yeah, no, and I had to put it on my, my phone. Um, somebody asked, how do you see a size 22 or smaller dry fly when it's on the water? Um, like I said before, I, I don't ever fish those by themselves. <laughs> um, I tend to fish those as a trailer behind something. So it's even, you know, I, we fish a lot of foam patterns and bigger stuff out here. But, you know, if you're if you're trying to make a nicer presentation and not have something big and splashy on top of the water, even put it behind a, a parachute pheasant tail or a parachute atom, something that you can see in like a 14 or a 16. That's got a, a even, you know, if they've got, um, you know, colored posts or something to kind of make it easier to see. Um, but trailer it behind that. If you're going to try and fish something as small as like a 22, um, that's definitely a, a good way to do it. Um, and how quick are you changing out your fly if you're not attracting fish? What, what's your answer on that, Tom? <laughs> mm. uh, it depends on if I see fish feeding or I don't. If I don't see fish feeding uh, actively, then I'll probably stick with the same fly for a while because it may be just I'm not fishing over fish or my presentation isn't right. If the fish are feeding actively on the surface or just below the surface and I don't do anything, um, then I'll be, you know, pretty quick to change. I'll give them, I don't know, dozen casts, 20 casts, because you want to make sure that you're getting the right presentation and that doesn't work, then I'll change. How about you, Maggie? Uh oh, do we lose you again, Maggie? Mm -hmm. Maggie? Yep, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so how so, about you? What how how quick are you to change? I'm kind of stubborn, so I tend to mm -hmm. I tend to leave it and kind of move around and see because I'll convince myself that it's going to work at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, sometimes, especially if I'm boat fishing, you know, I'll try and have like a nymph rig set up and then a dry fly rig set up so I can kind of change in between and see what's going on. Um, so somebody asked to imitate a case caddis nymph. Should you imitate them in the case um, or free from the case with the bright green body? I tend to say, don't worry about the case because I mean, fish definitely eat the case. If you ever, if you ever pump a fish's stomach, you definitely find rocks and things in there. Um, so they definitely eat case caddis, but I would say they're more opportunistically feeding on ones that are outside of the case or have emerged from the case or are in the drift. So I would say as far as caddis patterns go, I tend to fish um, the more out of the case. 
Yeah, I mean, a pupa is a lot is a, a lot more available to the fish than something stuck to the bottom, right? Because trout trout do feed off the bottom, literally p- picking stuff off the bottom, but it's it's not as common. Mm-hmm. Um, they're more yeah. likely to take stuff in the drift, and what's going to be in the drift is usually a pupa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's you pretty much always find these cases and things when you're flipping over rocks. You don't see a ton of them just like hanging out right on top. Um, yeah. And you don't find trout, you know, using their fins to flip over rocks and plucking the cases off the bottom there. Um, no. you tend, they tend to feed a whole lot more, like you said, in the drift. And, um, yeah. and you know, if people don't understand fully what we mean by feeding in the drift, um, that's just a tool that all these insects, caddis, mayflies, stoneflies, all use in order for them to get to the surface to emerge, they'll use it, you know, if there's a disturbance or if there's some kind of um, compromising factor to come into their stream where they don't like it anymore, if maybe pollution's poured in or anything like that, they'll use the drift as a tool to kind of move downstream and just kind of let go basically and let themselves go in the stream and let it carry them down. Um, Like we were just talking about, we're not fishing nymphs as something that's underneath a rock you're fishing it as something that's that's being pulled down in the water column and so um that's that's what we're trying to imitate with our different nymph patterns so um what would be a good searching fly if nothing's really happening so again my opinion is like i love using the october caddis as a searching pattern just to try and get something up on it just because it's big and it's fun to fish um but I would say a lot of times you end up getting that first seed on a blue wing pattern in the fall, if if anything. What are your thoughts there, Tom? Well, you know, Maggie, you have your you have your uh, waters that you fish, and I have my waters <laughs> that I fish. But I, I would suggest, you know, there are local favorites, and there are flies that work better than others in in various parts of the country and in various streams because of what's hatching there or just the mood and the fish and the best bet is is to contact your local orvis store and say hey what's a good searching pattern um they're gonna know a lot better than us unless you're fishing the you know southern vermont area or the catskills or for me for in my case or you're fishing the jackson hole area um, then you're a lot better off uh, getting something that's more dialed into your to your local um, area. So, you know, contact the closest Orvis store. Um, they'll have a, they'll have a much better idea of what flies are going to work. Yep. And they'll know what's going on. We've got some weird stuff going on with our rivers right now with your reclamation cutting off dam flows, a very significant amount in the last couple of days. So like things like that impact your local fishery. And so being able to check in with your local fly shop, your local Orvis store, they're going to be able to tell you exactly what's going on because as much as we might be seeing dry insects coming off the water right now, um, we're not seeing a ton of fish feeding on the surface because they've been all screwed up with the changes in the water flows. So Mm. again, making, Mm. making those check-ins are super important because they're going to know and have it dialed exactly what, what's going on. Yep. Local knowledge is always the best. But yeah, um, somebody asked how do fish react to cold swings and will bugs be significantly affected as well? I mean, the fish are definitely going to react, but you got to keep in mind a lot, the fish are in the water and it takes a, a while for the air temperature to really penetrate and change the water. Um, I find it pretty cool. I drive over our local river every morning and you can kind of tell the temperature differences based on whether or not there's kind of steam coming off the water. And then you know that the mm-hmm. water temperature is warmer than the air temperature. Um, but like I mentioned at the beginning, it's all based on a, on a math problem, so to speak, that the, of the air temperature and the water temperature. Um, but you know, the colder it gets, the more we might get into midges and things like that. Um, but I would still say you're going to see fish rising in, in 30 and 40 degrees, at least out here. Um, would you say it's the same in the East there, Tom? Uh, sometimes (laughs) not as, not as much as I'd like. Right. <laughs> uh, more likely in uh, more likely in tailwaters like the you know 
Farmington or uh, the South Holston, uh, less likely in uh, the more freestone streams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that brings me to our third kind of family here that would be emerging in the fall. Again, this kind of is an extended hatch, so they may or may not be out late in October, but um, hydrocycidae caddis are really cool bugs. Um, they're free living caddis. They're very predatory um, versus the mayflies that we were just talking about earlier that tend to, you know, scrape algae and be more vegetarians. Um, these hydrocycidae caddis tend to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, they use their silk spinners instead of making a case to build a net or a web, much like a spider would. And in that drift, as the water's kind of rushing by, they'll catch all sorts of things in their little nets that they've spun and eat them. Um, we found tons and tons of these um, when we were fishing this past week. And I mean, it was almost every rock you flipped over, you found a hydrocycidae caddis. And again, dead giveaway is that they're not in a case. Um, and then they have really prominent, um, we call them anal gills, but right on the tail end of that larva, you see some little like filamentous like gills that are coming off the end of it. Um, do we have a, do we have a close up of them? Oh yeah. That's yep, right yeah. Right there. And yeah. if you look kind of where that brown rock is just below it, you can see his little net that he spun. You can see his little web there or her little web. Mm hmm. Um, but that's a very green one. So you can tell it, it's been, you know, feeding on, on different things that's given it, you know, those chlorophyll cells are given it that green color from feeding on different plant material or maybe other insects that have been feeding on plants. So it's super greened up. That's why we use a lot of green when we're nymph fishing. Um, but these are a really easy one to imitate again, because they don't have a case on them. When they emerge, they're a little bit nondescript. Um, they're definitely a kind of mottled brown, grayish color. Again, elk hair caddis, just really general patterns, X caddis, stuff like that will work, work well for these guys. Um, you know, 16s, I would say is kind of your ballpark size, but, um, but it's always good just to throw, I, I think, caddis patterns on if you're not seeing stuff happening because I feel like they're the underappreciated of the big three insect groups. And a lot of times people um, people kind of skip the caddis and that tends to be what fish really like feeding on. Um, you can see <laughs> the adult there has a really slender body and he has pretty long antennae, but nothing, nothing super, super fancy or distinct about the adult pattern. But again, I think it's definitely something worth fishing with. Mm -hmm. Oops. Um, kind of same story here. This one you may see emerging into October. Um, the Ryacophila is the green rockworm or the free living caddis as well. Um, just like the hydrocycidae, these guys do not build a case. They're going to be free living and predatory. Um, this is another one I got an awesome picture of under the scope, super greened up from what it was feeding on. And you can see those big chomping jaws right at the top of it. So definitely eating more, more live things than it is um, scraping algae and things like that. But then to the right hand side, if you, if you've ever fished like a mother's day caddis hatch or seen the Brachycentris family, um, those are pretty small gray um, caddis. And these are a very similar adult pattern to that. So we're talking like maybe an 18, maybe even smaller than that. Um, the biggest difference being that it has more of a rounded wing, but then you put yourself in a, in a fish's fin, so to speak, and they're not really paying attention to whether or not the back wing is rounded or straight because they can't necessarily <laughs> see that. Um, you know, when we're, when we're fishing, we focus on color, size, shape, profile, and action. Um, but when they're sitting on top of the water with those tent like wings that caddis have, um, I would say that the, the way that the back of the hind wing looks is not the most, um, keyed in thing that the fish is doing. I would say as far as fishing caddis, um, fishy, pretty splashy and, a lot of times you'll get a, get a fish on a caddis, like in your first or second cast. Um, they're a great pattern 
to skitter around and kind of move and twitch a little bit because they tend to kind of run across the water. Um, they're definitely not as dainty as fishing a mayfly, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes skating a caddis, particularly in the fall, um, can work pretty well. And there's a lot of great um, guidebooks to hatches. Um, one that I like to use is this pocket guide to hatches of Western streams. Like I said, if you really want to get into the weeds, um, you can find uh, on macroinvertebrates.org, you can learn how to key things out, you know, based on counting gills and different, you know, antennae size and things like that. So it's really, um, it's really more complicated than you need to make it when it comes to fishing actually, but there's a great, you know, hatch guide to Eastern streams, hatch guide to Western streams. Um, Orvis has some books that are sometimes hard to find. I don't know if we've got them on the website, but we've got some little uh, caddis hatch guides and mayfly hatch guides um, that provide some great information. They're uh, probably not on the website. People are better <laughs> off uh, going to a fly shop or their local Orvis store or yep, going to a, a bookstore. Yeah, book like this, Bug Water is a really good one. And they've all got different information. A lot of them kind of market themselves as more of a bug book. And then you get in there and you find out it's more about fly tying and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so the last um, really big group of aquatic insects that we're talking about in fall is the order Diptera. And Diptera covers all sorts of things from house flies to snipe flies to crane flies. But Diptera translates to two wings. So they've only got one set of wings. They don't have multiples, whereas um, a lot of the other groups we've talked about have multiple sets of wings. But they go through the same type of metamorphosis that your caddis flies do. It's an aquatic complete cycle, so they pupate at some point before they emerge. Um, I would say I'm hard-pressed to do any kind of insect sampling in any type of stream anywhere and not come up with some type of diptera species. Um, they're maggot or worm-like in appearance. It is an aquatic maggot after all. Um, they have no jointed legs that are present. So again, real wormy. That's why worm patterns kind of work all the time too. They don't always have an obvious head capsule. And as I mentioned, they have one pair of wings as an adult. Um, they do have what's called haltiers, which are a really tiny, tiny pair of reduced wings. And I'll show you some of those on a picture on one of the next slides. Um, but it's not a true pair of wings that functions at all in flight. But Chironomids, Chironomidae, however you want to say it, um, that's our midge, midge group. And that's kind of a, a big catch-all for winter fishing, fall fishing. Um, if, you're, if you're seeing fish feeding and you're not sure what they're feeding on and it's some itty, itty bitty, it's probably a midge. Um, these are all pictures. The first two pictures... Um, are of them in the larval stage. That third picture is of a pupa. And then that last picture there is of an adult. Um, they can have multiple generations per year. They can have one generation per year. So they're super variable depending on what type of water you're finding them in. You'll find them in still water. You'll find them in moving water. Um, but they're pretty prolific. Um, and then they come in a very variation of colors there. You've got some creamy colors on the left. And then you've got the blood worm there kind of in the middle that's super red. And then to the far right there, you can see that adult. Um, and I've got circled in red there, the haltier. So it's a teeny tiny reduced wing that you can only really see under a microscope. So the fish is definitely not going to pay attention to that. Um, but just like the mayfly, there's a dead giveaway to tell males and females apart. And in this picture, we're looking at a male because he has plumose antennae. So he's got those feather-like antennae. Um, if they have no feather-like antennae, just regular antennae, it is a female. So that's ah, I didn't the way know that. It's a part, yeah. Interesting. But you're talking like what our biggest midge pattern might be like a size 18. <laughs> You know, they have there are midges that are as big as a 14, but they're more typically on still waters than mm -hmm. uh, 
that yeah. you're seeing those. Eight, yeah, 18 in stream is about as big as I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah, that's kind of the go-to size, I would say, you know, if you still want to be able to see it. Um, yeah. Again, yeah. these are a great pattern to trailer behind something else if you have a hard time seeing stuff. Um, you know, getting any kind of high vis midge pattern is great. Um, that's one of our best sellers is Birch Birchell's midge pattern with the, the high vis post on top. It kind of looks like an emerger pattern, almost has that clean camera looking body, so it hangs down a little bit with our column. Um, but yeah, midges, midges are a great, great option if it's cold outside and you're not sure what to fish, but you're seeing fish on the surface. Um, you know, as far as your underwater option, zebra midge is one of the most common ones around. Um, always tend to work when it's fall or winter for me anyways. Um, you definitely got, um, ones that we didn't mention, like the crane fly. Crane flies are pretty prolific year round in a lot of bodies of water. That's where your, your funny mop fly comes into play. Those work well for crane fly larva imitations. And then outside of your aquatic insects, so ones that don't, you know, live their nymphal or larval life under the water and emerge out as an adult, you've still got some random terrestrials kicking around. Somebody mentioned earlier about ants. Um, we've had a really crazy big ant year. Sometimes it's not a big ant year. Sometimes it is. It's almost like the cicada thing. Um, but, you know, I yeah. think if you went out and fished with ants right now, you'd probably still do pretty well. We've got a lot of flying ants, carpenter ants, honey ants, things like that, that end up lighting on the water and fish love a good meal out of this. Here's a good question from George. Um, George, I guess uh, the suggestion for uh, hook setting is that, you know, sometimes you're going to miss fish on these small flies. No doubt about it. It's a, it's a tiny hook mm -hmm. and it's not always going to catch. So um, sometimes you're going to miss them. I wouldn't, uh, I, I would go really easy on your hook set, just gently enough to tighten. Um, you know, it's, uh, you, you don't need much to set the hook. You're either going to, you're either going to catch the fish in a good place, hook it in a good place, or it's not going to catch. And just, you know, and you don't need much force to set that tiny hook. So um, easy, easy on the sets. And as far as hooks, bending out on larger fish. Um, two things I can think of is uh, maybe you are using um, uh, a, a rod that's a little too uh, stiff and heavy and, you know, a, a, a three weight, or if you're using like a six, a four or five weight or three or a four weight might be better. It's going to protect that um, hook a little bit more. And the other thing is, um, Hook, hooks bending out on larger fish um, sounds like a bad hook to me. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know where you're getting your flies, but you may want to you may want to take it up with if they're Orvis flies. We want to know about it. Um, you may want to take it up with your fly shop wherever you get your flies, be, or where the, wherever you get your hooks if you tie your own. Because oh, you said you tie them. You're tying them. Yeah, um, I try a different brand of hooks. They shouldn't they shouldn't bend out. If you're playing the fish, it shouldn't bend out on on larger fish, uh, unless you're unless you're you know unless you're catching like you know two foot long brown trout, uh, and you're using a five x tippet maybe, but um, it shouldn't bend out. So you may want to try a different brand of hooks. And if, if they're Orvis hooks, we want to know about it too. Yeah, you never know. I mean, when you're going through thousands upon thousands of flies in different shops and packs of hooks and things every once in a while you get you get a lemon so hopefully um, yeah hopefully you got you can get a better better pack of hooks and get that figured out but yeah i tend to think you know even though fish eat pretty splashy on things like caddis um they still tend to sip a little bit more on the mayflies when they're coming up to eat them they eat pretty splashy on things like ants and stuff too in my experience um but you've got to think as it's getting colder and cooling down, everybody's getting a little bit more lethargic, right? So it might not be as fast of a hook set as you think. So I think, you know, like Tom said, kind of easing into it and not snatching it away from them is probably the key. 
Yeah, but that's not going to solve the hook bending problem. No, right? that's not going to solve the hook bending yeah. problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, hooks have to be tempered, and sometimes they don't get the temper quite right in a batch, like Maggie said, and it may be just a batch of hooks that you got. Let's see. We got any more urgent questions from anyone? Um. What could be tried when you don't have the exact size and color of the abundant yeah. food source? I mean, that's again where I, I like throwing a terrestrial in the mix because, you know, you don't have like a big ant hatch happening on the water, so to speak, at one time. They might be feeding on the middle of blue wings. I'll tell you a funny story. I was fishing, I guess, two falls ago with Perk Perkins, and we had just the biggest blue wing hatch, throngs of blue wings on the water tons of gray drakes on the water there were all sorts of bugs coming off and the guy puts on a little cinnamon honey ant and catches a 20 inch fish <laughs> <laughs> so i think sometimes get them a change up you know from that thing that they're seeing so much of can make a big difference too yeah i mean tr you, tr you try to get close enough you're not always going to have the exact match for the bug i mean you know we we all can't we all can't have a one-to-one -one, uh uh, relationship between the flies in our box and the hatches we might see. So you have to, you have to, uh, you know, the other thing you can do is you can um, cut your fly back, cut a larger fly back a little bit, cut the wings a little shorter, cut the tail a little shorter and the hackle with a pair of scissors. Um, and, um, you know, color is probably not as important, but a lot of people carry uh, uh, permanent markers in different colors, you know, olives and, and reds and blacks and browns and um, you can you can touch up a fly um, often with uh, with a, a permanent marker. I know a lot of guides who do that. Oh, our store is so. across the street from Staples, and I feel like there's a lot of guides that come in our store and buy bugs, and then they go to Staples and buy sharpies. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, they do work. And you don't need any special brand, you know, as long as it's the, the alcohol-based permanent markers, they'll they'll all work pretty well. Mm -hmm. Sharpies work just as well as anything. And somebody's mentioning the midge larva that you showed looks skinny and long, yet zebra midge patterns seem to be generally shorter and stouter. Um, well, the, the key to that is that these that I was, show, was showing you pictures of, they've been dead in alcohol for a little while, and we've kind of stretched them out to take pictures of them. But a lot of times when they're alive in the water, they're a little bit more curled up or they're making that wriggling motion. Um, they have those segmented bodies. So that's what the good, um, you know, wire wrap segmentation on your zebra midge is, is mimicking there. So, you know, you can definitely go skinnier. We saw a fly called the like atomic worm and some different things like that that are a little bit smaller than a regular like annelid worm um, that could mimic, you know, one of those bigger midge patterns. But not necessarily. I still think the fish tend to like, you know, size 18 red and black zebra midge pretty well. Well, another thing is that if, that fish, um, if, if they can get at the pupas, they'll they'll take a midge pupa before they'll take a larva because the pupas are, are a lot more often in uh, the, the surface film or they're closer to the surface um, and they're they're drifting more because they're hatching. And zebra midge is just a dead ringer for a small caddis pupa. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe it may not even, fish may not even think it's a larva. But um, for whatever reason, they sure work when mm -hmm. fish are eating midges. <laughs> zebra midge works. So we don't want to question it too much. We don't want to overthink all this stuff too much. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got time for one or two more questions. What's your what's your favorite color of zebra midge? I like brown. Um, I think the brown ones are nice in between the red and the black, you know, so they can kind of cover a little bit more bases. Um, so I tend to go with the brown color, if anything. Yeah, I like I like red, but uh, you know, if red doesn't work, I'll I'll try black. Mm -hmm. But you can tie them in all different colors, and you never know. I mean, they. I remember, we sell purple ones, well. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember fishing the South Platte many years ago when the only thing fish would take was a little tiny size twenty-two chartreuse midge, midge pupa mm -hmm. larva, and uh, for whatever reason, 
Um, so yeah, they can be lots of different colors, but try red, try black. And don't forget, I guess we've got, um, next Thursday on the 14th, um, we're doing a fall nymphing session. So we kind of touched on that a little bit. I know we were talking more about small dries of fall and we got into a little bit more of the entomological aspects of it all. But um, next Thursday at the same time, um, Tim Doughton and the Rochester Orvis store manager, Ethan, will be getting together to kind of talk more about fall nymphing techniques and patterns that you can use to imitate these. So they'll get into a lot of this stuff a little bit more in depth too, if you guys want to join in on that one and ask some more I saw, questions. I, um, I saw a couple questions on uh, Great Lakes Steelhead. Um, any input or advice? And I've got two pieces of advice because we, we don't have time to do it here tonight. One is that we've got a whole section, a uh, whole chapter on the Orvis Learning Center uh, videos about fishing for um, Great Lakes Steelhead in particular, but salmon fishing techniques are similar. And again, you're low, if you're in Steelhead country, you probably have an Orvis store. Uh, close by and uh, they're going to be able to give you a lot better advice than we can. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to give us a call if you got any questions because the I would say fall and spring are the most variable times of year for sure as far as weather and what's happening. So always give the give the, your local Orvis store a call and we can fill you in on what's going on. Yeah, I mean, we're not there. The stores aren't there just to sell you stuff. We love. We, we, we like love talking to, on the phone. <laughs> yeah, we, we love to help out, and we love to answer questions, and and we love talking fishing. So you know, um, use us, use the stores as your resource. That's that's what they're there for to help you. Um, you know, help you discover stuff to have more fun on the water. All right. Well, Maggie, we talked for an hour. That's probably enough. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we had a we had a great audience, and um, we had some really good questions. Really, really good questions, and um, we appreciate you tuning in. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, and again, don't forget to. Uh, Visit your store. They're there to help you. All right. Everybody have a good great night. rest of your night. Yep. Good night, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>